Well, good morning, good afternoon, and also apparently good evening to some of the people that are today in the audience. Uh, thank you very much for being here today. I hope that you really enjoy and learn from this webinar. I know I certainly will because this is a topic that I find interesting, fascinating, and I think we all need to learn more about. So what we're going to be talking today is about biogas to hydrogen, a net zero pathway. And let me tell you, um, Producing hydrogen from biogas uh, through steam uh, methane reforming uh, promises a pathway to net zero uh, carbon hydrogen at an attractive cost. However, we have to figure out whether this type of uh, hydrogen can actually be considered net zero and uh, whether they can uh, actually yield low cost hydrogen. These are the two things that we need to figure out and uh, how it compares to electro electrolytic hydrogen. And this is precisely what we're going to be talking about today. Um, we are going to be, we're gonna have four presentations from, from leading experts in the field today. And before I give you a chance to get to know them a little bit better, I just wanted to let you know that we are organizing this event uh, in preparation for our live event, our face-to-face -face event in Las Vegas on July 12th and 13th, which I hope all of you in the audience can join. I see that we have quite a lot of people from the international circuit there. I can see people from the UK, the Netherlands, also the US. Please introduce yourselves. We love to see uh, where you are coming from. And hopefully now the speakers can also uh, let, let you know where they, got, where they are, are, are situated. So let's get to know them a little bit better. First, can I ask Alice to please introduce yourself so that people in the audience can get to see you? Sure. Thank you, brother. Thanks. Go ahead. Yeah. Hey, Elise Bordelon. I'm in the mountain time zone here in Denver, Colorado. I'm a originator at Constellation Energy, the US's uh, leading power and gas supplier. I'm an originator of renewable natural gas and other sustainable products. Thank you very much, Elise. We saw this morning that there was some good news for hydrogen also coming from Colorado. So, you know, great to see all of those movements. Uh, next, Andy, please, if you could introduce yourself. Sure. My name is Andy Dvorsek. Uh, I'm the VP of Business Development at AMP Americas. AMP is a um, first of its kind renewable natural gas developer here in the United States. We have a particular focus on dairy. And so we'll talk through our process of decarbonization and how it affects uh, the hydrogen space. Happy to be here. Thanks for bringing me along. Thank you very much, Andy. Next, I'd like to ask Tanya to please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Tanya Peacock, and I'm Managing Director for California and for Hydrogen at EcoEngineers. And EcoEngineers is an international clean energy consulting firm. We have deep expertise in carbon life cycle analysis, asset development, compliance, auditing, whatever you need. We're headquartered in Des Moines, Iowa, and we are growing quickly around the US. We have offices in Canada, Mexico, Brazil, and I am based in Los Angeles. So very much looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tanya, and welcome. And last but most certainly not least, and I'd like to especially thank you, Gabriel, because uh, Gabriel actually helped us put this webinar together and made it possible. And uh, so, you know, for all your help and also uh, participating in the event with us. So, Gabriel, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Villain. Um, yeah, Gabriel Olson. I'm the director of carbon strategy and policy for Biotech Hydrogen. Uh, Biotech is a hydrogen generation technology company. Uh, we're based in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I'm actually uh, personally located in San Antonio, Texas. We have a um, variety of facilities and uh, staff across the United States. So thank you. And I'm definitely looking forward to the conversation. Fantastic. OK, so just before we continue, I'm just going to give you some very quick housekeeping. Because we only have one hour, don't, don't worry. It's going to be literally two minutes. And then we're going to move on to the presentations. OK, we're going to have four short presentations. And then at the very end, and they've been thoroughly prepared for you guys. They're going to give you amazing knowledge. So pay very close attention to those. And very importantly, please write down your questions and send them, not by the chat. By the chat, please keep introducing yourselves and also enduring you to introduce yourself by all means. But the questions, send them through the Q&A box at the bottom, in the toolbar at the bottom. 
it makes it a lot easier for us to manage them. And then we'll take them thereafter. We do have a few questions prepared, but I, honestly, it'd be better to hear from you because then we'll answer the questions that really matter, which is the ones that you have. So without, uh, yeah, one more thing, I always forget to say this. We are recording this session and you will have access to the materials. This will be sent by the end of the week to you. So you'll have access to them. So without further ado, Elise, you're the first one up. So I'm going to ask you to take your mute off, prepare your presentation and then begin. Thanks, Belen. Okay, I would like a thumbs up if you can see my screen. We can see your screen and we can hear you. So I think you're good to go. Great. Okay. Thanks for having us again on the call today. Again, I'm with Constellation. I'm an originator of renewable natural gas and other sustainable gas solutions such as carbon offsets, um, et cetera. So um, since I'm first, I'm going to try to be a little speedy because I think the question and answer session today is going to be the most valuable part of this presentation. Okay, so what is RNG? This is the RNG, RNG 101 presentation here. RNG here in the US is defined as pipeline quality natural gas derived from the decomposition of organic matter. Um, this is about 99% methane. It is really defined as being pipeline quality. If it does not meet the specs of the pipeline in which it's being injected into, it is not considered RNG at that point. Our most common sources of this decomposition is landfills, wastewater treatment plants, and commercial and agricultural waste digesters. And the biggest benefit, especially for the people in the call here today, I would say, in addition to IRA tax credits, would be that there's no facility or equipment modifications required to consume renewable natural gas. You would still purchase your fossil fuel natural gas the way you always have or planned on it, and then you are essentially matching your consumption with a renewable natural gas purchase. So it's important here to realize that this is a drop-in fuel. Um, a piece of paperwork is really gonna solidify this, this purchase. Here's just a very quick overview of projects throughout the US. This is not a comprehensive list. Um, it is everything that is reported to the Renewable Natural Gas Coalition. However, just to give you an example of what we have active in the market, you'll see that projects are in, in different phases of development. Some are flowing gas on the pipeline right now. Some are under construction. Some are just planned and reported, but maybe haven't even begun construction. Um, just wanted to let you know what's here. If you were looking in specific areas, we would tell you what phase and development they're in. And also, is this project owner interested in selling their renewable natural gas to a customer such as yourself. Um, I'd like to point out that the pipeline connection is important here. So hypothetically, if you were in Hawaii producing hydrogen, I could not take hydrogen um, from the contiguous states and send it to you. I would need to find a renewable natural gas source in Hawaii to supply you. And this is just a brief overview of the feedstocks that are used to create RNG in the marketplace today. On the left-hand side of your screen, you'll see a dramatic increase in RNG production over the past 20 years. A lot of this is influenced by the renewable fuel standard. We're gonna stay away from that topic today, but the incentives there did grow the market to where it is today. What's more important for you here is knowing the feedstocks that are available to you uh, municipal solid waste or landfill gas is our most common source today. It's the most prevalent. Um, this has a lot to do with just the sheer volume of production that can come from a landfill. Second behind that, we have agricultural waste, not just dairy, but swine, et cetera. And then followed lastly with food waste and wastewater treatment plant. These are also um, methane sources. And I think it's important for you guys on the phone to know that they all have varying production sizes. So uh, here listed, you'll get these slides after the call, but a landfill on average produces about 1,000 to 4,000 MMBTUs or decatherms of RNG per day, some larger, some smaller. Um, but this is important for you to know because a project owner typically wants to sell 100% of their production to one customer. If you don't consume this much, then you might just be asking for a small portion of their supply. 
we can help with this. Um, however, just keep that in mind. Let's say you want to, you think you need 200 decatherms or MMBTUs of RNG per day. A wastewater treatment plant might be a perfect fit for you. If the CI score would be relevant to you, we'll get further into that in the call today. But keep in mind that the size and the production of each plant is important for you to consider when you're looking to make a purchase. This is a contract um, structure for Constellation and any other marketer in the game. Essentially, the way we operate here is that you're here on the right-hand side as an end user. You're buying environmental attributes in a natural gas supply from Constellation or another natural gas supplier. Your contract is with us. Our contract as a marketer is actually with the RNG project owner. Just as an FYI, that is typically how our contract structure works. Now you can contract directly with an RNG project owner. Um, however, you might see that this is more common in the space right now. And then the last three slides for me are really the meat and potatoes. You'll want to pay attention to these slides after the call, um, but your homework, for me, this is all about timing. You want to begin your discovery process before Treasury guidance on the IRA tax credits has been finalized. Because this does take a lot of time and you want to get all of the big items out of the way before you start procuring RNG. First and foremost, consider the legal entity name of your buying party. Um, do you have the credit to make a purchase like this? Uh, as an example, you might be looking at 10 years times 30 plus dollars per decatherm times 200 decatherms a day. Um, does your legal entity have the credit worthiness to sign a contract like that with the person that you're buying it from? If not, do you have other options there? Maybe we can talk about a letter of credit, et cetera. Um, so keep that in mind and start that process now. Interview your RNG suppliers like Constellation, call Andy as well. Um, and start reviewing contract language. You don't want a big item, a non-negotiable to get in the way once you've identified a feedstock or a contract in a project. You want to get some of that language solidified before you have found the project that you want. There's a lot of work you can get out of the way sooner than that. And then the last item I have on my list is complete a life cycle assessment of your hydrogen production with fossil fuel, natural gas, you're gonna to need to receive that CI score to determine what type of RNG you need if you do wanna become net zero. Um, calling a company like Eco Engineers is a great place to start for that. Start these items before July. Some other things to keep in mind, and this goes for every RNG buyer in the marketplace. We typically recommend a 12 to 24 month lead time on procurement. Um, new construction can take 18 to 24 months, et cetera. A lot of new construction starts after they have a signed contract with a buyer in mind. That is what allows them to get the financing to start ordering expensive parts, et cetera. Keep in mind that the closer your project is to flowing gas on the pipeline, the more expensive it typically gets. The value increases over time. A lot of the risk has been taken out because of things like all the permits are approved. Um, and then you're, you're competing against current market prices at that point. So just keep that in mind. We're recommending 24 months as a lead time. Uh, also keep in mind that RNG, when we're speaking about it, we're typically talking about the physical gas and the environmental attributes as separate items. The EAs or environmental attributes are typically sold separately and physical gas from the project is, is purchased by the local pipeline in which it's injected into. There is a potential that you can buy physical gas, but it's typically unbundled. Make sure to ask, is your price bundled or unbundled? Again, RNG projects want you to buy 100% of production. That's not always true, um, but it it definitely and certainly brings down the price and it brings down the complexity of the contracts if they have one buyer buying 100% of production. 10-year contracts are typically recommended for a great price. However, I'm sure people would consider doing shorter contracts. Just keep in mind that the shorter your contract is, 
the more you are competing with spot market prices for your competitive markets. And that's the, the next bullet point. Consider the value of the RNG that you're buying when it's sold to other markets. You are you will be competing with that price of the value of this RNG sold to other parties. And any of your RNG suppliers are going to explain that to you over the phone, what you're competing against for your price. Um, and then, of course, just to plug for us, work with a marketer. It could diversify your supply sources and provide backup. So if your contract needs firm commitment with backup projects, um, aggregating a volume together from multiple projects could be helpful. And then quickly, uh, this is how the typical process goes with a marketer like ourselves, discovery calls. The four items here in parentheses are what we really need to start looking for you. What volume are you looking for? How long of a contract are you able to sign? What date do you need to start consuming this gas? And the CI, the carbon intensity score of the RNG project, which one do you need to reach the tax credit goal that you're looking for? We put NDAs in place. That way we can share information two ways, um, you know, confidential information. We can allow you to go on site visits and get all of the confidential documentation from project owners and start discussing contracts. Term sheets is our next step. This is where I call this the promise ring. This is really, we're setting expectations to work together very closely, even though it could take 90 plus days to get a contract in place. Um, essentially, this is solidifying the relationship. This isn't a really important step for us. And then off take contract. Um, red lines going back and forth between lawyers can take, in my opinion, at least 90 days. We can start that process now before you know what type of RNG you need. So those are my recommendations. I'm done now. I think I'm ready to pass it on to Andy. Thank you very much, Elise. And Andy, if you want to start preparing it, thank you very much for the recommendations. It's a lot to keep in mind, actually. It's a lot of things, especially in, in terms of like project management, would you have to be doing what? So. Can everybody see my screen? Go right ahead and yes, but we can not see it like in presentation. Oh, no. Perfect. Yeah, you're ready to go. OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what we do as a company. So Amp Americas is a developer. So we have been in the market since 2011. We got our start producing dairy, taking dairy manure, producing a renewable fuel and producing electricity that eventually turned into renewable gas for trucks with a dairy in Indiana called Fair Oaks. So if any of you have ever purchased Fair Life products, we work with that group um, and that cooperative as they produce a product. As the markets in California evolved, as well as as the markets in the EPA allowed dairy gas to qualify for both the RFS as well as the low carbon fuel standard program, our gas became more valuable. And we started marketing our gas into those markets and we converted our company from a largely a compressed natural gas development company into a renewable natural gas company. So snapshot of our company is in 2022, we produced 1.3 million MMBTUs of renewable natural gas from dairy manure on a just as a snapshot. That's about an 11 percent market share on total dairy gas produced in the United States. That gas is all ultra low CI gas. So to give some reference here, as Elise talked about CI earlier, uh, fossil natural gas typically has a carbon intensity score in the range of 50 to 60 grams of CO2e per megajoule. And dairy gas in our portfolio has a score of a negative 250 to negative 300 score. And that gives you a direct reference to the amount of carbon that's abated through our process. The majority of our carbon abated is from the methane avoided by converting the manure into a fuel. So instead of that methane being emitted to the atmosphere for normal practices, we capture it, clean it, compress it, put it into a pipeline and use it in transportation as our typical means. We have 14 projects across the country in, develop in, in operation, and we have a number of them in development going forward. We think we'll produce somewhere around 2.5 million carbon dioxide, metric tons of carbon dioxide abatement by 2027. We're doing about a half a million uh, at a run rate right now. Here's a snapshot of where a couple of our projects are located. We've got a cluster in Idaho. One of those is electricity. The balance of those are renewable natural gas. And then we've got a large cluster in the Midwest where we take 
Um, like I said, we take the dairy manure, process it through a digester, we capture that gas, refine it, and put it into a pipeline. Collectively, we've got about 200,000 cows across the country that are, are producing this gas. So like I said earlier, our markets have historically been taking that gas and putting it into a pipeline and selling it into the transportation market in California. In selling it into the transportation in and market in California, we have produced hydrogen. We've also produced a compressed natural gas that goes into the trucking fleet, produces LCFS credits or low carbon fuel standard credits through California, or produces uh, D3 RINs through the EPA program. Those are what pays back the, the, the investment that we make in our projects. What's changed more recently is um, there was a statistic, a statistic I saw the other day that said about 88% of global emissions are part of some form of target for reductions. So corporate entities, utilities, universities, individuals, as well as states and other entities are looking to make reductions. And they're trying to figure out how to do it. All of our efforts have focused in on transportation because that's the market exists in California and Oregon and other states. But we're seeing an evolution in the U.S. in the voluntary space where the gas can be used for other things. Hydrogen is an area of particular interest because hydrogen is seen as a next wave of energy usage in the transportation space, as well as just um, global energy transfer as a whole. So what makes things different is underneath both the California process, as well as what's called the greenhouse gas protocol, carbon is seen differently. And there's, there's a debate that is, is alive today about carbon accounting. What has traditionally been the standard of practice is a Greek model, which has been a developed process through California, where carbon intensity scores are determined. When you have a carbon intensity score, it then allows you to determine how many credits you get per MMBTU and therefore your revenue stream. This picture that we're showing here is a direct comparison of what a landfill can produce as far as carbon abatement on a dollar per metric ton basis versus a dairy facility. So the top line shows a typical landfill at a CI score around 45. Your cost of abatement underneath the California process is about $1,000 per metric ton of CO2E. If you use a dairy project, which has a, has a carbon intensity score of two, 280 in this case, our cost per metric ton of carbon abated is much lower. Therefore, we're much more efficient. Our cost per MMBTU is much higher because of the value proposition, but the actual abatement is much better. Long term, we think this creates a lot of value. And in the hydrogen space, we're looking at this as an opportunity. However, in the hydrogen space, they tend to follow a different type of model under the GHG protocol or the Argon Greek model. Again, we see a value proposition for dairy being better than other forms of gas, in this case, again, landfill, but things get a little bit tighter. Long story short, there are different ways of looking at carbon accounting through different models. Different, different states have a patchwork process. So make sure when you're buying carbon, you understand which process you're working under and under what type of structure. So I'm going to pass it off right now. And um, I appreciate the time and, uh, and appreciate being here and invited to the panel. And I'm excited for any of the questions that come about. Thank you very much, Andy, for your presentation. and. Uh... I'd like just to take the opportunity to say, Alice, thank you very much for answering all those questions. There's a lot of questions coming, Andy, also for you. So feel free to take a look. And Tanya, you're up next. Uh, as you can see, we're doing good time. So don't go shy on me now with the questions because we'll need them at the end. So if you wanna prepare your screen, perfect. And I can see your screen perfectly. So go we'll right ahead, Tanya. Okay, I will continue on. Um, so, Thank you, Andy and Elise, for the, for the perfect setup. What I'm going to talk about is, um, I'm, I'm going to talk about carbon intensity scores and life cycle analysis. I'm going to do that in the context of just briefly reviewing the opportunities for hydrogen in the Inflation Reduction Act. And I'm sure most of us are aware that the carbon, the carbon intensity score there is key. Um, I'm going to provide just a super high level overview of life cycle analysis. And then I'll talk about the biogas to hydrogen pathway from a CI perspective. But basically, I want to leave you with one key point, which has already been set up uh, or already stated by both Andy and Elise, and that's know your CI score. Um, 
you know, we, we know that the energy transition is happening on a global basis. That's not news. Uh, in the US, it seems that the Department of Energy every week or is, there's a new funding opportunity for some sort of clean energy development. And while it's really exciting, it is hard to keep up. And so one way of making sure that you can really maximize the, avail the available value from all of these credits and incentives is to make sure that you design your projects to achieve from the outset your desired target CI score. And this is why. <laughs> you can see that from the, uh, this, you, you can see the cliff here that if you come in at 0.45, lower, below 0.45 kilograms of hydrogen per kilogram, sorry, 0.45, below 0.45 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of hydrogen produced, you get the full value of the hydrogen production tax credit. But if you're at 0.45 kilograms of CO2, you lose two thirds of the potential value of that credit. So it's quite a, quite a severe um, cliff really, that if you, so you, so you, so you wanna make sure that you're early on in the project development process, you're understanding what all of the, the inputs are that will affect the CI score. Um, The, the other prime, and I just want to mention it because it's available, but the other primary opportunity really for hydrogen in the Inflation Reduction Act is the 45Q tax credit, and that's for the sequestration of CO2. It can really provide some value to projects that come in higher than the maximum amount of the 45V credit from a CI perspective, so anything with for higher than four kilograms of CO2. Um, and, and some projects, you know, talk to people who are looking at trying to, depending on the stage of their project, looking at um, both the 45V and the 45Q, they can't be stacked. And the other thing that's uncertain is we're still waiting for some guidance from the IRS in terms of the extent to which you can go back and forth. But I just thought I'd mention that as well. The next, so the how this, this talk about CI scores, how do you measure what a CI score is? How, how do you know? Um, so it's this process called a life cycle analysis. And in general, a life cycle analysis consists of four components. There's the process of defining the goal um, of, the, of the project. And then the, the heart of the matter is really the inventory analysis. So it's looking at all of the upstream inputs and then also the emissions at the site of the product site of production associated with your project. Um, then there's also potentially an impact assessment component. And then the where where the where the, the expertise and the, the art of it comes in is the interpretation of the results of this inventory analysis and impact assessment. So there, there are different types of life cycle assessment um, uh, that can be done for, for different uses and you know, for, for different purposes. For energy production projects, it's really a process base, sometimes called an attributional life cycle analysis. And this is really the process of looking at the entire supply chain of products and technologies that um, are being used in the project. The other, you may probably have heard, so companies that have sustainability goals or net zero goals, there's also the, the process of examining the emissions from scope one, two, and three emissions of the enterprise operations along the entire supply chain. Um, that's a, it's a related process, but slightly different. And I, I won't go deeper into the, uh, the LCA details than that, but. Um, in the, as part of the LCA process, and Andy talked about this somewhat, the importance of knowing what the boundaries are 
for the different program or incentive that you're looking to utilize the, the revenue streams from for your project. So just for example, and, and boundaries have to do with how far up the supply chain do you go? And it seems like that might be easy, but it's um, th th there, there's still a lot of uncertainty in, in that area. Uh, so, so just for example, the, the two big programs in the US that are supporting hydrogen production, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, that measures CO2 from the site of the product of production. So the upstream inputs don't uh, factor into the CI score. But if you're looking at using the 45V production tax credit under the Inflation Reduction Act, and also DOE's hydrogen shot initiative, some of the funding there, it's a well to wheels calculation. So it's going all the way up um, to if you're producing hydrogen from natural gas, it goes all the way back to the natural gas well site and actually includes the fugitive, the fugitive emissions from the production site. So, and then includes the transportation of the gas to the, where the hydrogen is being produced. It's in, in where some of this complexity comes in. If you're looking at creating hydrogen from uh, if you're looking at electrolytic hydrogen, and it's it's a little bit puzzling, but the production, transportation, and the installation of the solar panels and wind turbines that are used to generate the electricity to create the electrolytic hydrogen are not included within the system boundaries of the argon greet model. And the argon greet model is the one is the model that is used for um, life cycle analysis for the 45V production tax credit. Um, so, so wind and solar, hydrogen produced from wind and solar potentially can get a, a zero CI score um, because of the way the boundaries are drawn in the argon greet model. So just using those two examples to show that this, this question of system boundaries is very much in play when thinking about hydrogen as a global commodity and how do you, um, the, the opportunities for, for producing hydrogen, say in the US and exporting it to other markets, you also have to be aware of what the system boundaries are in those other jurisdictions and regulatory regimes in order to have your hydrogen be, clean hydrogen be accepted in those markets. Uh, and then I wanted to show this slide because we're, you know, so wind and solar can be zero, have a, you know, have a zero CI score. What you get when you're looking at the RNG to hydrogen pathway is really this opportunity to get below zero. And, and what, what I'm trying to show here with this chart is that you can really work with the RNG supply that you're using to produce the hydrogen to come up with, to manage the final CI score of your hydrogen. And the lower, and what, what I'm showing here is you, so the, so the lower the CI of the, the, the RNG, of course, the lower the CI of the hydrogen. And sometimes producers will look at, you know, where am I gonna get the most value for my RNG? Is it selling directly into a transportation market and getting the full value of the environmental credits on the transportation side, the low carbon fuel standard in California and the renewable, the federal renewable fuel standard. And so there is quite a lot of value there. What hydrogen has is this HRI credit in the transportation market. So the, um, you know, you, one, you can manage the CI score of your hydrogen with the RNG. And two, there's this opportunity for generating credits based on the capacity of the station, not the amount that's dispensed. Um, and so when you're looking at, you know, very low CI or if you're, you know, negative 150 CI, CI uh, RNG, if you convert that to hydrogen, 
and in, in utilize the the both the both the dispensing credit under the low carbon fuel standard and the HRI credit, there can be quite a lot of value. And so you can you can see that the hydrogen value proposition can be higher than just the state straight RNG value proposition. Um, I will stop there. Happy to discuss it more if there are questions and uh, hand this over to Gabe, who is our final speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tanya. And Gabe, it's your turn now. Okay, I'll jump in. Let me just stop. The, there we go. So you can go. Wow, like you guys have done a great job of answering questions. With a special mention to Elise, of course, uh, but you know, you, you've you been really active. So keep them coming, keep them coming on the audience side and keep them coming also the answers on the other side. Uh, Gabe, yeah, we can see that. Right. <clears throat> yeah, go right ahead. So yes, I'm again, I'm Gabriel Olson, Director of Carbon Strategy and Policy at Biotech. Um, as I mentioned, we are a hydrogen generation technology company. Um, and we generate hydrogen molecules locally, uh, closer to the actual end use, uh, which is a difference uh, compared to the traditional hydrogen uh, industry that's currently focused around large centralized refineries, kind of you know, oil, oil refinery scale you know, operations. Um, that allows us to reduce and avoid, um, you know, sort of that long distance transport, the liquefaction of hydrogen, uh, the storage costs, and also... Uh, you know, subsequently allows us to avoid the energy and carbon emissions associated with all of that. Um, that 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 ends up being kind of a net positive for us. So RNG also plays a key role in our production strategy um, in terms of reaching carbon neutrality or carbon negativity. Uh, and I'll but I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, you know, we've developed a small, modular, and scalable hydrogen generation uh, technology package uh, that produces up to 600 tons of hydrogen per year. Um, so that's a relatively small scale, but again, the focus is on the end user and emerging end uses rather than existing large industrial scale, um, you know, kind of operations. So, it, you know, we actually do use, of course, steam methane reformation, um, we, but we're using a more efficient heat recovery system that was developed by Sandia National Lab. Um, that's the 20 to 30 percent more efficient than traditional SMRs. And we also produce uh, and operate a full line of hydrogen transportation and storage equipment that helps to facilitate the distribution of hydrogen molecules to the actual end use. Um, you know, really that's that's allowing us to service that last mile challenge, um, distributing the hydrogen to a wide variety of emerging customers. There we go. So uh, as I mentioned, we are local. We're also distributed, um, you know, close to the end user. That means that we have operations across the United States. We are headquartered in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, our storage and transport business is um, based in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, we have commercial production facility uh, that is actually going online in the next uh, month or two outside of St. Louis, Missouri, which we're very excited about. That's going to be our first commercial production facility. Um, and additional pro uh, planned production um, facilities across the US, starting in California, Northern and Southern California, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Michigan through 2025. So over the next couple of years, we'll be rolling those out. Bottom line, we're building a distributed hydrogen production network. Um, and that's 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 really what we believe is going to be the key ingredient is getting the hydrogen to the actual end users. Uh, there's a lot of attention, a lot of discussion uh, at the policy and uh, kind of incentivization uh, level in, in the United States right now around these large scale hydrogen hubs. Uh, but we think there's there's a lot of opportunity in actually the logistics and distribution of the hydrogen once it's produced. So uh, just you know, I think I think the other folks, uh, Tanya, kind of touched on this in terms of carbon intensity. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but you know, really what this chart is, it's based on the California Air Resource um, you know Board GREET model, which is a LCA kind of framework for understanding carbon intensity of a variety of different alternative fuels, but specifically, um, uh, you know, kind of hydrogen production pathways are, sh you know, shown here. Uh, the takeaway from this chart is really fundamentally that 100% dairy RNG when used as the feedstock in an SMR process can produce deeply negative 
uh, let's say in this example, negative 300 CI hydrogen. Now that might be amazing and impressive, but it'd be kind of expensive, right? Because you're using a lot of a deeply negative and highly valuable feedstock. Uh, what we can do is actually more cost effectively uh, use a blend of uh, dairy RNG, let's say a 30% blend or some other, you know, low carbon, uh, you know, RNG uh, to achieve a carbon neutral hydrogen output. So by blending that with traditional fossil natural gas, um, we're effectively able to get to a cost effective um, hydrogen product that's both valuable and eligible for, um, you know, kind of the incentive credits that are available as well as achieving carbon neutrality. And that, at the end of the day, is really our goal. Um, you know, and at the end of the day, you know, carbon neutrality for our hydrogen really is our core offering. That is, that, that's what we're aiming to do. Um, and, and, you know, we have a lot of strong response from customers that are looking for that either on the voluntary market or they're seeing different pathways for them to engage through the California LCFS system, the RFS uh, program at the federal level um, as as that evolves, and of course the production tax credit under the Inflation Reduction Act, which we're very excited about because that will allow the use of hydrogen across the board for many types of end uses. Um, you know, we see RNG as kind of the linchpin for doing this cost effectively. There are other pathways, uh, carbon capture, things like that, but but RNG for us is is the most cost effective and the most flexible in terms of deployment um, for multiple facilities in multiple locations. Um, and so, you know, we see it as a great way to offset the fossil natural gas that we typically use as a feedstock. And the way we need to do that is through what's called book and claim accounting. Um, and that's, uh, you know, kind of alluded to by Andy and Elise. And um, I think, you know, Tanya, you might have mentioned this, but the idea is that we're able to use the environmental assets or attributes from uh, a dairy farm, let's say, in one part of the United States for um, the production of hydrogen in another part of the United States, and essentially a virtual contract. So from the farm to the local utility pipeline, and then finally delivered to the point of the hydrogen production facility, um, the ability to utilize that kind of book and claim, that virtual, uh, you know, kind of carbon accounting uh, to produce RNG is critical for us to enable a low cost and distributed carbon neutral hydrogen product. Um, so right now, uh, you know, I think, you know, Tony, you mentioned this, but, you know, we see a strong uh, pathway for approval and uh, kind of a, you know, positive policy outcome under the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, you know, for the, the production tax credit for, for hydrogen. We see that as a strong and optimistic outcome. Um, and we believe that that's going to make this all possible. Um, in, the, in the meantime, that concept has already been proven and is very functional in the California LCFS, as well as the RFS programs. So this is not the first time that it's been done, but we believe that it should be expanded and continue to be utilized that way. And I think that is all I had. So I actually left it with my email address if anyone wants to jot that down, but I'm also happy to uh, jump to the conversation. Thank you very much, Gabriel. And I mean, to the speakers, if you're happy to be contacted, by all means, like put your email in the in the chat, you know, so people can take it. Uh, it's going to be in the presentations anyway, but, you know, I'm just saying, if you can't wait, if you're that interested in biogas that you'd like to talk to them now, then, uh, then it's there. Um, so I'd like to ask a few questions, uh, just warming it up so that it, maybe the audience can send more questions through. Um, so the first question I'd like to ask you, and I'm going to leave it out open for you, anyone to answer as they like. And I think the most Im Im important question really to answer is, how much value does the, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, production tax credit uh, have in hydrogen production and in its pricing. So I don't know who wants to take the question, but to start, Gabriel, do you want to start? And then you guys sure. can add and, and give your, your two cents. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, no, that's a great question. And, and you know, Tanya, I think you also put some numbers up around that. Um, at the high end, uh, there is the potential for up to $3 per kilogram of produced hydrogen for carbon, effectively carbon neutral hydrogen. And there's a tiered you know, set of incentives that has a declining value um, if if you do not meet that target at the, at, at the low end of the incentive uh, tier, it's if you're at a 33 CI approximately, 
uh, you're eligible for 60, uh, up to 60 cents um, of incentive value. So you have to meet certain conditions in terms of, you know, prevailing wage and apprenticeship and some other things. But, uh, you know, ideal outcome is up to $3 per kilogram. Uh, what that does, and this is, this is an important point for us, we see this as potentially enabling cost neutral, carbon neutral hydrogen. So if the if the cost of the RNG feedstock is able to um, to essentially meet the marginal you know value of the PTC, then it, then in theory you could have carbon neutral uh, hydrogen that does not actually cost the end user uh, anything extra. Um, that that you know there's going to be some some you know, interesting math and kind of you know, up and down around that depending on the type of RNG available and depending on contract terms and all of those things. Uh, but that's that's what we're optimistic about. When will we know? Do we know when you know we're gonna get clarification as to how it's gonna work from the IRA side? Please tell me. <laughs> no, I mean like we know, I know I'm joking. We're... Is it 2023? Is it 2024? I don't know if I was talking about the EU, I'd be like, yeah, 2025-ish. <laughs> so I just wonder. So there's rumors that there will be rough guidance on the implementation of the production tax credit 45V uh, sometime in the next few months. But they've been saying that for a couple of months. That rough guidance might give us clarity on some of the details around carbon intensity, the the function of the of the uh, greed model, uh, and the viability or restrictions on book and claim accounting. All of those things are incredibly important for determining how we utilize these resources. Final implementation is not expected until next year. So uh, eligibility for the program began at the beginning of this year. So in theory, there's going to be some kind of retroactive true up of tax credit eligibility from all the projects that were eligible during this year, but I, I don't know what that looks like yet. And anyone else, please chime in I, if I'm just talking Yes, nonsense. please. Andy, Elise, Tanya, anything to add? I think this is a very important question, so I think you guys agree with me as well. So. Yeah, no, I think Gabe did a, a great job of answering it. I have to say, I don't think we're really expecting any guidance from Treasury until probably the end of the year. We hoped for earlier, but it's probably going to be towards the end. I have to tell you guys, you're spoiled. <laughs> you I'm going to go on vacation years. just just to wait for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed. At least you were going to say something. Sorry, I interrupted you there. Oh, I thought it would be helpful for us uh, gas people. Could you, Gabe, put that $3 per kilogram converted into a hypothetical dollars per decatherm price? You're on mute. He's thinking, but he doesn't even <laughs> need a calculator. Have you, re have you realized? <laughs> this is pretty incredible. Uh, dollars per decatherm. I'd have to do some quick math. Uh, Andy knows that I love that. So let me, it's, it's, I'll get back Andy to you. Andy probably has it. At least it's going to depend on your CI value of your gas. Right. So if right. your CI value is low, it's going to be better right. and, and vice versa. So it's, it's really hard to kind of, kind of earmark that definitely. It's a production tax credit for hydrogen, remember, not for RNG. <laughs> it's, it's a complicated formula that doesn't exist yet. What I will say about it is that, you know, the California market, which is by and large the largest market for low CI gas, um, it's it's there's some there's some parity that happens at certain CI levels and then there's some non parity that happens. And so everybody's trying to figure that out. We're one of the groups in that process. Do we sell our gas to California or do we sell it to somebody else? And a lot of that's going to come down to price, but it's also going to come down to term and different structures within the agreements. Because if right. you sell it to California, you're largely exposed to market fluctuations. In a nascent, non-liquid market, you're going to see some bumps. Whereas if you go a long-term contract, you may want to take some concessions on price to, mm -hmm. to secure that long-term contracting because it changes how you finance projects. So there's a lot of variability you got to think through in that process. But it's going to depend on CI. And ultimately, and the other thing that's important on CI is California use, and I, I spoke to this, but California uses a Greek model, which is a... a, a derivation of the argon greek model which is slightly different and you will get a different ci score under argon which is going to be the backbone behind the ira than you would get if you were to sell your gas in california so you have to have the ability to look at both ci scores understand your value proposition and then float back and forth between the two and more importantly the argon model and tanya and their team can speak to this it's it's overly complex 
more so than in California, oftentimes you open that model and it'll crash your computer. So um, now we are hearing grumblings that through the, because the IRA, you're going to start to see some guidance and some simplified tools to be utilized for, for estimating those numbers, which can help um, streamline the process to get this thing to happen. Because if everybody has to focus on that model, it's going to be very difficult. And Tanya and their team will be, become very active as, as people look for guidance. Yes. I'll take payment for that plug later on, Tanya. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> You guys are working excellently as a team. You're selling this very, very well. I have to, I'd like to ask you one question that is my own really. Um, is there anyone at the moment or any entity that can actually certify that biogas is net zero or um, even negative in, 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 in emissions? In, in who are they? <laughs> you, you you mean like an, an officially recognized certification I mean, of some so, sort? Yeah. So again, back to the the forty five V tax credit, the Inflation Reduction Act does require that a certified uh, entity do the life cycle analysis to determine the CI score. So they. So I think that's the answer to your question. Yes, it's you can't um, you you can't just submit your own CI score. For, for the Inflation Reduction Act credit. You have to have a, a third party do that for you. Okay, thank you. There, I, there have a question, so, I mean, I, I was gonna say, you know, there, so the, there are organizations looking at a global level of how do you create, say, a hydrogen passport with, the, you know, with, with CI metrics, with the agreed upon met, uh, methodology so that there can be more transparency and ultimately more liquidity in the market because hydrogen is a global commodity and so there needs to be consistency in terms of how you how you measure the CI and and a certification process. Thank you but very that's much. All Look works. This is sort of a part of part it's of what I was to do. Yeah, yeah. without getting into too much detail about this whole issue of boundaries. There's not agreement. Um, between like different countries and different regulatory regimes about what the boundary conditions should be. To, to offer um, a, a slight additional amount of complication is Argon and more specifically the GHG protocol, which is used by nine, some 90 plus percent of, of Fortune 500 companies as their carbon accounting platform, doesn't necessarily have the same view on booking claim as California does. And the problem is, is that in the world of renewable natural gas without book and claim, you can't exist and you can't function. And so there's some there's some work that needs to be done to clean up those issues. And all of us are part of different groups that are lobbying and, and having conversations with the right people to get create some of that education and that understanding on how book and claim can be correctly utilized without any risk of double counting in the process. So that's an a, a additional step that needs to be taken. Thank you very much for clarifying, Andy. This one thing, there is about seven questions open. I was wondering, because we have only five minutes, if you guys can take a look at the questions and see if you'd like to answer any specifically. I think maybe there is a couple of them that are out of scope that maybe not so much for us to answer today, but others that are probably, you know, good to be answered. So at least I can see that you're answering a question as we're going. Um, if I may ask it uh, live, it says, sure. how are you, are you addressing the regulatory risk in contracting these long-term agreements, i.e. 10-year sure. agreement based on economic of current policy structure, which can be changed quickly? Go right ahead. Thanks. That is a very common question. We get um, people want to sign 10-year contracts and they say, I'm committed to this price in ten year, for 10 years. What if some rule comes along that says this feedstock no longer qualifies for my needs? What do I do then? Typically, of course, everyone in the contracting process, including the marketer or the project owner, wants to put the risk on you. They want to take it off of themselves and, and sell a very safe contract for their side. That's the whole, that's why it's going to take longer than 90 days to negotiate a contract. Um, but there are some flexibility things we can do to mitigate those risks. As an example, in my early slides, I said you definitely need to consider the value of this gas in another market because there could be a point one day when you don't want to buy that gas anymore and you want to sell it to another market where you can sell it for more than you paid for it. We could allow something like that in our contracts. 
Thank you very much, Elise. Um, Andy, you're answering a question. I'm catching you because you're answering the questions. It says, when evaluating the effectiveness of a technology of, for the production of hydrogen, what metrics are used? If you could just answer it live. Sure, I can I can start this and Gabriel can probably, probably jump in here, but I think the efficiency of the conversion is the most importantness, it more most important process, cost of that conversion as well. Uh, steam methane reformation is by and large the most the standard used in the space. There are other processes um, that um, can be less carbon intense. Um, you can do carbon capture and sequestration on the back end of um, steam methane reformation to, to address that. Um, but you know. There are certain minerals and certain uh, additives that are required for other processes that are rare. And so you run into cost effectiveness in that process. So right now, I think the tried and true process is, is SMR, but I'll, I'll pass it to our resident hydrogen expert to, to answer that question probably better than I can. No, I think I think you answered it well. And I, I would agree, I mean, without you know, throwing electrolysis under the bus, I think it is obviously getting a lot of attention, a lot of investment, but uh, there's challenges in terms of scaling that technology up. The electrical demands on the grid are substantial for electrolysis, and it's not you can't just put them down anywhere. You have to substantially improve the local infrastructure to allow the power to literally flow to those systems. Um, it's quite complicated, quite expensive. Um, SMR has been around for a long time. Obviously, if it is not done with a carbon neutral feedstock or a carbon negative feedstock, you're going to have uh, a large amount of net carbon emissions, and that is a problem. So that is literally why this is so important, because it, this tried and true technology that is being operated at very large scales by very large companies uh, has the potential to utilize RNG, which is an incredibly valuable, uh, you know, brown gold as they call it in order to to you know to really take advantage of this sort of source of carbon emissions that would otherwise potentially be allowed to escape the atmosphere and that's i think i think that's really what we're talking about is making sure we don't leave those emissions reductions on the table thank you very much gabriel and andy uh, and elise and Tanya for answering the questions i have just one more i wanted to answer so Tanya's already answered it but i think it's important i'm doing uh, a lot of biogas in other markets and we're very much talking about converting it into biomethane rather than converting it into hydrogen for a variety of reasons. Each market is different. Um, but the question here is why convert biogas to hydrogen if it can be upgraded to biomethane? Is it just a matter of the current regulatory issues you know, with the IRA and you know, the hydrogen incentives? Or is there something else, some other reason why it would make sense to go for hydrogen rather than biomethane? Like more well, I mean, technical matters, yeah. you know? The reality is, you're taking, whatever. Yeah. when you do this conversion process, you're taking biogas, which is roughly 50% carbon dioxide, 50% methane. You refine it to a biomethane, which is a, a 90 plus percent methane. And then you're injecting that by scrubbing out any additional impurities that a pipeline requires and putting it in a pipeline. Once it's in the pipeline, it can go everywhere and can be moved easily. Transport is a big issue. You can also do the same thing with hydrogen. You can take the hydrogen produce it, put it back into to natural gas pipelines and move it around as well. So a lot of this comes down to transportation and where you want the fuels to be. Everybody wants to do electricity and every, it's the sexy thing. If you look at the amount of electricity required to convert our vehicle fleet, just transportation alone, the amount of infrastructure needed in addition would be staggering. Whereas if you can utilize existing infrastructure that's already there and you can clean up the carbon through the process, you, it's kind of a win-win. So that's why I think you see hydrogen in parallel to biomethane, but really biomethane is an interim step to the hydrogen process. Anyone else? Any other questions that you'd like to answer before we leave? Because it's now time. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'd like to thank Alice, uh, Andy, Tanya, and Gabriel for doing a great job today of explaining uh, biogas and its possibilities to produce hydrogen for, to all of us. And thank you very much for the people in the audience as well for coming today. I hope that you do join us in Las Vegas in July for the conference on Mad H2USA. But if not, I hope I, at least I get to see you in the next webinars. We're doing other webinars. We're doing one on webinar on hydrogen and utilities. We're doing one on hydrogen hubs amongst others. So please uh, join us for the next conversation because I think this is great. We all learn. There's a thing about information and there's a thing about networking too. Now you know who you need to go to when you have any questions surrounding biogas or any projects. These are your guys. So make note of, your, of their emails and be in touch. Thank you very much, guys. And see you next time. Thank you.